Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Generations Family Health Center for hosting today's session, Chest Pain in Children with Dr. Gerald Engoff. Dr. Engoff was most recently an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics at Dartmouth Hitch Hitch ah, Medical Center in New Hampshire. Uh, he specializes in pediatric and adult con uh, congenital heart disease and served as co-director of the Dartmouth Hitchcock Adult Congenital Heart Program. And we're just so very, very lucky to have him as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Engoff, when you're ready, please begin. Good morning, everybody. Our talk, uh, as, uh, as uh, Kristen mentioned, is chest pain evaluation in children and adolescents. I have no conflicts of interest. And as mentioned, this, is, um, this talk is, uh, is available for uh, one hour of uh, continuing education credit. Objectives. <laughs> to be able to describe how chest pain differs from in children from adults, to be able to use a careful history and exam to define chest pain risk characteristics, and <clears throat> be able to complete a chest pain evaluation confidently with minimal need for testing and consultation. As an overview and outline, talk a little bit about my background, which Kristen's already mentioned, uh, to present uh, three clinical scenarios for your consideration relating to this topic, <clears throat> to discuss what I like to call the pediatric chest pain conundrum, uh, some key data from uh, the literature, to discuss diagnosis and treatment, and then <clears throat> wrap up with some conclusions. As mentioned, I was most recently in the academic setting at Dartmouth Hitchcock in New Hampshire with practice in both adult and pediatric cardiology, a focus on adult and congenital heart disease. I've also been a medical IT consultant concentrating on process, optimized workflows, and improved quality and outcomes. And you'll perhaps see a, a, a bit of that process orientation in, in my talk. I'd, I'd like to pose uh, some pre-evaluation questions to try and get an idea of where you folks are on, on this topic and hopefully to make it a little bit interactive. So <clears throat> for uh, these questions first, um, do you perform pediatric chest pain evaluations? Do you feel comfortable performing these evaluations? Do you know what key history and exam elements should be? And do you know what role testing should have? If you could uh, help and kind of answer these questions and, and we'll you know, have a, a, a sense of uh, where you folks are and how to focus. Kristen, maybe you can kind of let me know when, you, yeah. when you've got some sense of them. Oh, we are... About 50% per, uh, answered. I'll give it about 20 more seconds and then I'll close it. All right, let's do, we will close it now. And share results. Okay. Um, all right. Kind of a mixture of, of yeses and and, and no's. <clears throat> I think that's that's great, and that will be helpful. So, so looking at these. Um, We'll kind of loop back to these questions as uh, when when we finish up. 
I'd like to present three clinical scenarios and see what you think about uh, these, uh, these brief um, uh, patient presentations. The first is a 15-year-old young lady, high school student, with chest pain of two weeks duration who was referred for a pediatric cardiology consultation. <clears throat> she had been seen in the emergency room the day before, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the day after the onset of her discomfort. She had a whole array of testing, chest x-rays, EKGs, CT. Every, all of her testing was normal. And she was in the emergency room, as you can imagine, for several hours. And the cost at the, at the time was $7,000 or more, I'm sure, a lot more uh, even today than that for such an emergency room evaluation. <clears throat> at the time of her consult, here was some of her chest pain. <clears throat> the pain and stabbing initially at 7 and 10 intensity, lasting seconds, left upper the anterior chest radiating to her shoulder went back. It was pleuritic, that, that means worse with breathing, and positional, occurring multiple times a day, improving better with uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay, so that's what where we were to start off with. So I'd like to again ask some questions, see what you guys think. And do you think the symptom is cardiac? Unlikely, possibly, or likely. Can we do a poll? Okay. See what you folks think. Just based on what we have, have go forward with this once I get your thoughts. We'll give it 15 or so more seconds. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so we have possibly and unlikely as the uh, about 50-50 choice. <clears throat> okay. That's, that is helpful. Okay, well, a little bit more <clears throat> from uh, scenario number one, some further history. The day before the onset of her pain <clears throat> was the first cheerleader practice of the season. She was a cheerleader. <clears throat> and her activity, she mostly helped toss her teammates in the air <clears throat> and awoke the next day with the pain the pain had been diminishing and was almost gone at the time of her cardiology consultation. So this was further history <laughs> into what the circumstances were <laughs> when the symptoms started. And her physical examination <clears throat> was notable for, for the occurrence of pain, the deep inspiration, which was her symptom, left upper chest tenderness, on firm palpation, also reproducing her symptom. So <clears throat> the conclusion was clearly that this was musculoskeletal and the treatment was just reassurance. It was going away and continuing with the NSAIDs. So <clears throat> further history really helped nail this down. She did not need any further testing. Okay, here's another scenario. A seven-year-old boy with chest pain and shortness of breath of two months duration referred for pediatric cardiology consultation. In multiple primary care visits, EKG and chest x-ray were normal. And uh, use of an inhaler did not provide any improvement in the shortness of breath aspect. And at the time of his visit, some further history, <clears throat> the symptom was in the morning most days, a pressure sensation lasting hours and diffuse, worse with breathing, exclusively occurring at rest, with shortness of breath, and actually some improvement with activities and exertion. So uh, again, your thoughts. <clears throat> you think it's 
likely, possibly, or unlikely that he has his symptoms as the result of a cardiac condition. And again, we'll be able to go further with this, but I want to get your thoughts <clears throat> at this point in the in the presentation. Okay, okay. there's our results. Great. I'll, I'll, um, a, a a good split between unlikely, possibly, and likely, with, with with the majority in the middle. It's almost like a bit of a bell-shaped curve. That's very helpful. Okay, and so we'll. We'll go a little bit further and see what you think. Some further history always helps. History, history, history. He had missed many days from his new school. I just asked, well, well how's school going? <clears throat> he had recently changed schools because the family needed to move. They needed to move because the family house had burned down. And it burned down two months prior on Christmas Eve. If you recall, his symptoms were two months duration. And he said that when asked that he'd lost all his toys and presents in the fire and started to cry. His physical examination was absolutely normal. And it was increasingly clear that, a, a, that he was disturbed by what had the disruption in his life. And the first reassurance and a very pointed discussion with parents that perhaps he should have some counseling. <clears throat> the conclusion, this was not a cardiac symptom. Okay, clinical scenario number three. A 12-year-old boy referred for medical excuse from the school gym class. Oh, his history to start two to three months of vague exertional central chest ache occurring, most recently playing basketball, rapidly relieved with rest, no resting symptoms, otherwise well, <clears throat> without a family history of any concern. His exam was completely normal, and his EKG was normal. Okay, so. <clears throat> With this as a, a start to the scenario, again, unlikely, possibly, or likely that this might be cardiac. Again, we'll <clears throat> have some further aspects for you to consider, but I'd like you to know what your thoughts are so far. Very similar to the last, a, a distribution, um, some felt unlikely, likely, and, and uh, <clears throat> a majority of that is possibly. So <clears throat> some further, some further uh, elements. Uh, he was referred for an echocardiogram based on the initial history. <clears throat> Normal structure and function to uh, the ventricles and valves, normal pulmonary pressure, <clears throat> but an anomalous coronary artery origin was identified by echocardiogram with the left main coronary artery arising <clears throat> from the right and coursing between the main pulmonary artery and the aorta where it can easily be pinched by the pulsations of those vessels, particularly during exercise when increased cardiac output occurs. <clears throat> so <clears throat> based on this finding, he was referred for a cardiac MRI and possible intervention because he was found on ECHO to have a condition <clears throat> which certainly could give rise to the history that we have. Again, the history is primary, 
that he had exertional discomfort with exercise relieved the breast. <clears throat> and this was an instance where symptoms were felt to be cardiac in origin. So here's the chest pain conundrum, the pediatric chest pain conundrum. <clears throat> the symptom is frequent in childhood. It creates a high level of concern among family <clears throat> and providers, resulting often in urgent referrals, emergency room uh, referrals, uh, urgent care visits. And the cost for the evaluation is high. <clears throat> is uh, overall be, because of the multiple interventions and levels of care. And here's the key overriding thought, a cardiac cause of chest pain in children is rare. Children are not small adults, heart attacks, myocardial infarction, with extremely rare exceptions do not occur in children. <clears throat> a rule out myocardial infarction protocol, often the first the, the the first protocol when uh, emerge for emergency room visits just is is uh, is out of line and and leads to expense rather than than improved outcomes. Okay, well, if one does have a a, a child that or an adolescent with chest pain. If one considers all the possible causes of pain, this is what one can find as a list from a well-known textbook. For cardiac causes, <clears throat> here are all the possibilities. For pulmonary causes, here are all the possibilities. You really can't read this, and the reason is a list of these multiple causes is not, is not really helpful. One can never exclude each and every one of these causes, and certainly any attempt would only lead to a huge expense and perhaps uh, unwanted anxieties. Okay, so what really does help? History, history, history. And first of all, it's often sparse. It takes a, some effort to delve down and perhaps get the elements that will uh, perhaps uh, uh, solve the mystery, uh, like in scenarios one and two, was that additional history that, that, that provided the answer. And the elements to really think about and have in your head and ask, 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 <clears throat> what was the onset? <clears throat> Duration, frequency character, intensity, location, radiation, factors that made it worse, factors that made it better, any relationship to physical activity or exertion, <clears throat> any other related symptoms like dizziness, shortness of breath. <clears throat> As an example, Acute onset of severe, sharp, stabbing, pyretic pain in the center of the chest without relationship to exertion. Lasting seconds occurring off and on over two days, relieved with ibuprofen, improved with exercise. So distilling down the answers to these questions into a single sentence. And if you looked at that and you read it, you sort of say, hey, that doesn't sound like it's cardiac. <clears throat> so a good history really is, is synthesized can give you some answers and some ease with your conclusion. What about the literature? A couple of, um, of key articles. <clears throat> the first was a retrospective uh, study on screening for life-threatening illness in children presenting for, with, with chest pain from pediatrics in Boston Children's Hospital. <clears throat> 3,700 children. Seen. A cardiac cause was determined in, determined in 37 cases, any possible cardiac cause, just 1%. <laughs> of those reviewed, there were three deaths, but they weren't cardiac, two suicides and one 
from an unrelated cause. And no patient who was discharged from this evaluation died as a result of this condition. Well, if it wasn't cardiac, what was it? Well, the majority is unknown. Um, and of those known causes, musculoskeletal, 36%, pulmonary, 7%, asthma was a common factor. There were GI causes, certainly anxiety. And in this instance of the cardiac causes, it was just 1%, and this was a, uh, included all types of possibilities. <laughs> but only 19 of those 3,700 patients, or 0.5%, had intrinsic cardiac disease. Here's a drill down of those uh, with intrinsic cardiac disease. And notably, 14 of them had pericarditis and myocarditis. So in terms of structural heart disease, there were only five patients out of 3,700 who had structural heart disease. Rare. Another study, this was a guideline called the SCAMPS methodology that prospectively looked at children with chest pain presenting for pediatric consultation. Here was over 1,000 patients and only two 0.2% had chest pain due to cardiac etiology. One pericarditis and the other anomalous coronary origin like that, scenario three. And here was a, 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 a helpful aspect. Testing performed outside of the guideline recommendations demonstrated only incidental findings in patients returning for persistent symptoms didn't have heart disease. So the guideline was successful in really trying to narrow it down. There were some key abnormal elements to be wary of. Certainly any suggestion that the chest discomfort had an anginal quality to it, like in scenario number three, <clears throat> exertional discomfort with radiation, or any symptoms that suggested pericarditis and myocarditis, fever, pain increasing, <clears throat> lying down. Family history certainly was, was a a worthy uh, focus, and anything that was abnormal on, on, on physical examination to suggest an inflammatory disease or an underlying structural abnormality. And <clears throat> an abnormal EKG certainly was part of the evaluation, <clears throat> and it meant that you might consider a next step. But what was the next step? Well, it would be an echocardiogram. And here are all those, those elements, mostly that were in the last slide and, and in EKG findings, you sort of say, well, what, what abnormality to EKG? Well, we were talking about substantial abnormalities, <clears throat> right ventricular hypertrophy, left ventricular hypertrophy, extensive ST segment changes, um, prolonged QT, the uh, uh, abnormalities would be beyond any borderline findings. And even echocardiogram was a mixed blessing. Um, it did identify those two patients out of the over 1,000 with a cardiac cause, but there are also a number of incidental abnormalities, 7.3% uh, of 31 patients, and this was sort of a distraction. <clears throat> and when the test wasn't recommended by the guidelines, it, it was totally unhelpful. Additional testing, if you're thinking about what else, was really unhelpful in this study. Also, forms of stress testing, was, was uh, when, when it was done among this patient population, just didn't help at all. And ambulatory monitoring, Holter monitoring, didn't help at all. So uh, the, the, the array of tests that you might consider uh, with all of those possible other causes in mind, they just weren't helpful in this study. <clears throat> uh, a a follow-up with uh, the same protocol, now over 3,000 patients, <clears throat> showed again that a cardiac cause of, 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 the, of the chest pain uh, was, was rare, 0.25%. And of, of those six, were due to myocarditis and pericarditis, and there were only two cases of structural heart disease in over 3,000 patients. 
Non-cardiac causes were similar as before. Musculoskeletal were the most, most common GI pulmonary and so-called psychological. And a huge number of, uh, of causes just went, um, went, went unspecified as before in the other study. Okay, so what about treatments? Given the, the, the background that a, a cardiac cause of chest discomfort is rare and one needs really um, history to delve into it, but that usually and, and typically uh, the symptom isn't due to a cardiac cause. Well, treatments, well, nothing. I put that first on the list because of these findings, just on a statistical basis, uh, your concern should be extremely low. Observation over time clearly helps out. The, the idea of, of having someone come back to, to see if it's, if it's getting better. Reassurance has to be a large element of what one does and provides. Um, NSAIDs, if the story is musculoskeletal, if it suggests perhaps uh, some exercise-induced asthma or, or an asthma history, a trial of an inhaler, or antacids if, it, if, if a GI history is, is more suggested. Certainly to address any anxiety or depression. There are good questionnaires for depression um, uh, um, that um, you folks are probably using in in um, in, in in pediatrics uh, GAD questionnaire um, looking for for signs of depression, particularly in adolescents. Relaxation techniques. If you're if you're good at giving some advice, uh, either referring or providing it yourself, <clears throat> uh, for the, if 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 anxiety seems to be an element. And certainly, um, if warranted consideration for counseling, if well, one suggests that, that the uh, psychological issues are complex. Okay, so what about concluding this um, presentation? <clears throat> A cardiac cause of chest pain in children is rare and can be excluded by an outpatient visit. A careful history is essential. History, history, history. And the key elements on history and examination help some of those, those elements to really focus in on. An EKG is worthwhile for screening. Of the cardiac tests, an echo is best when disease is suspected, even though the yield will be extremely low. Treatments are usually symptomatic and, and include reassurance. <clears throat> okay, so maybe we can come back to the questions that we started with. Do you feel comfortable performing these evaluations? Do you know what history and exam elements should be and what the role of testing might be? You feel it you are comfortable with all these. Getting some responses, Kristen? Yep, I'll give it 10 more seconds just to get those last, last few. All right, we're gonna end it and we'll share results.
<clears throat> okay. Well, that's that's reassuring. <clears throat> okay. We can close that. So hopefully, yes to all, and and I really appreciate that uh, you folks have have focused in on on some of the, what I wanted to pass along. Uh, one additional thought. This is a, a wonderful paragraph from Bernard Lown, a a uh, a fabled cardiologist, one of my mentors who also was recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. <clears throat> of all the skills mastered by a physician, listening is by far the most difficult. When he learns to be attentive to the fluttering eyelid, the inaudible sigh, the unshed tear, proper listening enables one to comprehend the unique narrative of another human being. Even at its scientific best, medicine is dependent on the intimate story. For doctors, this is an exhilarating act of discovery. For patients, it defines a healer. Medicine is ultimately a social discipline that begins with a unique story from a fellow human being craving help. <clears throat> Listen to your patients. <clears throat> History is uh, can be like, like gold. <clears throat> Uh, hold back a little bit from the order list of all the tests you, you're, you're thinking of and, and see if you can't solve the mystery. Okay. All right, Dr. Uh, I got that was fantastic. Questions. Thank you so much. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A box, the chat box, use the raise hand feature, and I will unmute you. Uh, first question. Do you have a recommended resource for reading pediatric EKGs? Yes, I do. Um, there's, uh, I can I can pass it along to to Kristen. There's one really good book. It's thin, uh, and I always thought that textbooks <clears throat> had value inversely proportional to their weight, <clears throat> and this is a nice a nice uh, book on um, on reading pediatric EKGs. I, I, I can give the uh, give you the full title. Um, there's also um, a website I can provide which which has uh, some great resources on EKG interpretation um, as as well it has uh, uh, specific scenarios. Um, uh, knowns and unknowns, and uh, it, it has pediatric um, cardiology elements. Uh, one really should consider pediatric EKG reading um, as its its own its own area, and most EKGs are computer interpreted. And if you you should clearly put in the demographics. If if a computerized EKG interpretation doesn't have an age, it's going to interpret it as an adult EKG. So be sure in all your pediatric EKGs that the age is put in as part of the demographics because it affects how the computer reads it. There are a number of, uh, of tracing elements, a number of patterns that are normal in kids and abnormal in adults. So that, um, that, that can um, help uh, prevent you from heading down uh, the the, uh, the wrong pathway. Wonderful. Um, and just a shameless little plug about uh, Maven Project Mentoring. We do have specialty specific mentoring. So if uh, pediatric EKGs is something you really like to to spend some time uh, one on one, uh, we, we can do that. And Dr. Engoff is one of our mentors. <laughs> just a shameless little plug. <laughs> Um, if you are observing chest pain over time and eval has been normal, what is your approach to clearance for sports? A wonderful question. In fact, that's another talk that I give because the um, because primary care providers um, are frequently asked to to clear kids for sports, and this is the time of year when it starts to to uh, to happen, and there there are good protocols, good procedures 
for uh, uh, clearing uh, children and adolescents for sports participation. You might get a sense from this talk that um, the major factors are, are history and that the chance of your finding any heart disease is, 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 is going to be extremely, extremely low anyway. In fact, there are some with a cynical bent uh, which su suggests that the resources, even how, how well controlled, spent to, to, to clear kids for sports because of the rarity of heart disease might, might, um, <laughs> might be better spent um, um, elsewhere. So there, there is a good process for that, and and I have talked that where I really zero in on that. If um, if you um, if you'd like to hear it, um, certainly a careful history along the lines of, of of what I've mentioned, really for any symptoms, family history is um, is a strong element to find out, if, um, particularly among first degree relatives parents and siblings, if there's any heart trouble. <laughs> um, uh, a physical examination um, listing for murmurs, which is also a category all of itself, if you feel comfortable with differentiating abnormal and innocent murmurs. And an EKG as a screen is usually what's, what's uh, recommended, but the American Academy of Pediatrics has a good, has a good form that you can use and I can, I also have references for that. It's, in, it's, in, it's a, a part of that that um, that talk that I give. So certainly, if you'd like a more formal discussion of that, that's we we have that available. Thanks, Dr. Eindhoff. Um Regarding the case you did with fire, can exposure to toxins from the fires affect the heart? Uh, I, I think that would be a complex issue. Certainly, um, with the if we talked about the wildfires, particularly out in California and in the in Canada, is that if that's what it is, certainly uh, air pollution or anything that's in the air is going to be a health hazard, um, and a, a, a particularly with asthma and lung disease, I would so would say it would. It would it would make the possibility of an underlying cardiac condition more more a concern, but um, by itself um, wouldn't necessarily be a cause a direct cause over a short period of time of a heart condition in in children because basically the most uh, concerning defects. Uh, uh, Heart defects in children are congenital defects. Uh, there are some acquired heart conditions in children that are infectious and inflammatory. Uh, rheumatic fever, we don't see much of these days, but that would be an acquired cardiac condition in childhood as well as pericarditis and myocarditis, but those are infectious. Um, the other cardiac conditions in, in childhood are congenital, so that air pollution or, or smoke or fires might make those things worse, but by itself, I don't think would cause de novo a heart condition. Um, how would you approach a report of chest pain in a child during a telemedicine visit when you can't do an exam or an EKG? I concentrate on the history as I've developed, um, really get into detail those, those various elements in, in, in terms of um, of the character, the nature, the onset, the circumstances, uh, the uh, the intensity, uh, factors that improve, exacerbate, typically an exertional relationship. Um, anything else that's going on, um, uh, ask questions about family and school, get a sense of, of the environment. Um, if, I think I, I tried to make the point here that the most helpful aspect of um, of the evaluation was history, and certainly you can delve into that in a telemedicine visit, and uh, and and watch carefully for 
for uh, the the body language that's 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 associated with it. Um, it's a, you know, physical examination. Um, if you recall some of those elements, it, it, they were elements of an acute illness like like fever, malaise, um, and uh, uh, um, the uh, the circumstances of, of some in, uh, in, uh, 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 infectious illness. The, the, those were the main factors. Uh, and it's rare that physical examination is going to provide you the answer. It's really it's really history more than than um, anything else. And in fact, EKG, though recommended as a screening, was really a deciding factor. It's more the history, and I think you can take great advantage of that on telemedicine visit, and and certainly stratify your levels of concern so that you can observe over time and then and then arrange for that in-person visit when it, uh, when it fits. Great. Um, looking at the long list of non-helpful tests, what tests do you recommend for initial evaluation? None? I think the only uh, uh, test that, that really makes sense uh, for initial evaluation besides history examination is an EKG. A normal EKG is 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 certainly a great reassuring factor, and uh, as I mentioned, only when there was great concern from history and from some of those physical examination elements would a next test uh, be warranted, and that next test would be an echo, um, and an echo. Um, really still would have a low yield, but certainly if the echo is normal, you can stop there because we're looking mostly for congenital heart disease. <clears throat> and if the echo shows normal cardiac structure and function, I think you can stop there. Um, with um, Even with pericarditis and myocarditis, if ventricular function is normal and there's no pericardial effusion, the echo will, will help determine those factors. So if you even get that far, and you shouldn't have to go that, that far, um, um, an echocardiogram study when normal, you can stop there. Great. This first, okay, it's a little little different, but um, I'm seeing prediabetes in children as young as five and also early metabolic syndrome. How many years does it have to be present in a pediatric patient before it could cause increased risk of cardiovascular disease? I think metabolic syndrome, uh, if, if we'll let's zero in on that with, um, with, uh, uh, in, um, with, uh, with obesity, um, uh, insulin um, insensitivity with uh, uh, um, with with uh, diet hyperlipidemia, <clears throat> maybe even fatty liver. Uh, those are all se se severe concerns if one sees it in, in in childhood or adolescence. The manifestations of that will show up, I think, uh, in terms of the heart. In the adult years, in terms of acquired cardiac disease, mostly um, coronary artery disease <clears throat> and um, and uh, atherosclerosis, I think that's where you're going to to see the impact of that, and it's it's um, going to be a manifestation in the adult years of, uh, in the in the huge majority of cases. The only times that I've really seen a, a an instance in my years in cardiology practice, it was just one patient who had familial um, homozygous hypercholesterolemia who developed um, coronary artery um, uh, narrowings from, from cholesterol um, as, a, as a teenager. But uh, this was in, in, in somebody who had LDLs over 500 and was a, 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 a clear instance of a familial hypercholesterolemia 
<laughs> rather than being the that, that syndrome of, of prediabetes and metabolic syndrome. So you, you want to intervene in childhood to prevent adult occurrences of acquired cardiac disease. Um, should you trust the report of a normal pediatric EKG from a non-PEDS ED? Could you, could you repeat that? Yep. Should you trust the report of a normal pediatric EKG from a non-PEDS ED? I'm going to say emergency department. Uh, okay, I, that's what I, I was like. Well, if you, it's going to be a, if, 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 if it's computer interpreted, <clears throat> um, as a pediatric EKG, if the age is entered correctly and the computerized reading is norm, as normal EKG, then I think you can have confidence in that because the EKG interpretations have, are, are, um, are, are designed to err on the side of, 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 of calling out an abnormality if there's the suggestion of an abnormality or to crawl an EKG borderline for some reason. So if it's if it's a straightforward uh, interpretation of being a normal EKG uh, on a pediatric interpretation with a pediatric age entered in, I think you can be fairly confident of that. Um, when should we immediately refer to cardiology without doing testing? I think history again is is extremely helpful if if the discomfort that's described is uh, uh, is is cardiac in nature is the discomfort angital is it a vague heaviness tightness constriction in the in or around the chest related to physical activity or exertion relieved with rest particularly occurring with sports activity then I, I think you might consider um, the, uh, um, a, a, a cardiac referral. Another is if if syncope occurs with exertion, that's was on that list actually. Didn't really focus on it, but if you have someone who's who's exercising, running, and they pass out while exercising, then that is, can uh, I, I I think would be an instance where you might refer directly to, um, to uh, cardiology. Uh, we're talking about uh, scenarios, not just chest discomfort, but other cardiac scenarios. Um, if um, if um, there's documented tachycardia, heart rates that are rapid in the vicinity of 200 beats or more that start suddenly and resolve rapidly <laughs> that suggest a true arrhythmia. Those probably aren't going to be associated with chest discomfort, but that would be a, another red flag that might suggest that, that you refer <clears throat> uh, and, and, and seek out a, a opinion rather than to to uh, spend time pondering or testing. But in terms of chest discomfort, um, those elements that, that I mentioned, you go through them carefully and decide whether or not there, there really is a cardiac character to the discomfort, like in scenario number three. Um, what are common mistakes primary care providers make that I'm sorry, let me just start over. What are common mistakes primary care providers make you've seen to avoid? A, a recurrent theme to, to, to my talk. Um, in seeing referrals as a pediatric cardiologist, um, I would roll my eyes a bit when the referral was for chest pain <clears throat> without any other background or history or detail so that 
the 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 very occurrence of 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 the description chest pain results in in a referral or leads to a series of testing. Um, is that uh, to see emergency room visits where the the complaint was testing, and the impression and conclusion was that the I'm sorry that the complaint was chest pain, and the impression and conclusion was chest pain, and the plan was testing. Um, if if the if the symptom and the and the diagnosis are the same, it, to me it means there sort of wasn't much in between. So I I, th I think if there were if I would again caution um, uh, if if you if you indeed refer and there'll be a lot of instances where you want to refer based on 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 your concerns family concerns at least <clears throat> provide as much detail as much history as much background about the circumstances and uh, and and of of the symptom and 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 of the patient's experience as possible as part of the referral <laughs> and to make clear what the question is other than could you please uh, uh, diagnose this chest pain for me um, i would consider not just the term chest pain but chest discomfort because it's often not just a a, a pain. It can be a heaviness, a tightness, a discretion, a shortness of breath. So any discomfort in the, in the chest, um, fine to refer, but take take a little bit of time to delve into the into the detail and the circumstances rather than to have just the term chest pain be the reason for referral. Um. Do you want an EKG as part of the referral? Usually, if not, obviously, musculoskeletal uh, psychiatric. Doesn't have to be. Um, certainly, it's um, it, it, it's the um, of, of the tests that would be the first thing to do. But if there's a reason to to refer, um, you you can provide it. I think it's a good idea to to. to to obtain a uh, an EKG, sometimes it's not convenient. Sometimes it's not available. If again, if if your level of concern is is high, um, then uh, then a referral might might be appropriate. And one tenet that I've often passed along is a normal EKG doesn't exclude cardiac disease. If you recall, in scenario number three. The EKG was normal, even though there was a congenital underlying coronary artery hypertrophy. Wonderful. I don't see any more questions, so I will just take a quick pause to remind everyone when you complete your CME survey to use the correct date, August 14th, speaker Dr. Gerald Angoff, and you should re receive that CME certificate uh, right away. Um, if you uh, have any questions after this talk, remember that you can always use our e-consults on the community portal. Dr. Angoff is uh, is available. You can um, send directly to him. And if mentoring is something that you're interested in, especially around this topic, uh, we do have Maven Project volunteers ready to mentor in uh, EKGs, chest pain, all specialties, anything you can think of. Um, and lastly, for me, if you are if you are attending the NAC conference in Atlanta at the end of this month, uh, we'll be there, and we would love to meet you in person. So uh, you can shoot me a quick email, and uh, we can set up a time to meet. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. So Doc, oh, wait. Oh. Um. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much, Doctor Angoff. Have a great day, everybody.